for the wife clock. Um, yeah, along with that, I also thought um, there's that section that talks about that in like notch knockout like mutants mm -hmm. after mitosis they still have the oscillation even if they don't have like the notch express expression, expression for a bit i thought it was so cool because like i guess during mutation uh, mitosis they get like part of the cytoplasm and everything that's in it so that way they kind of get what the normal cell would have yeah i thought that was cool mm -hmm. yes Catherine or Annalie, it's just because you have, no worry, I'm gonna get to the rest because there are some people that haven't participated. So we are getting to an end. Catherine? Yeah, I agree with Annika that it was complex. I mean, I, the first half was okay and then it got into the nitty gritty and I was like, okay, I had to reread a couple of times just to kind of figure out what was happening. But I think one thing that, I don't know if it clarified or made it more complicated in my head was the, whole 90 minute cycle because figure two, I thought I understood how it went. And then I looked at figure two where it looks like it peaks at 90 and then kind of goes down for 90 and comes back up. Like it's a, the whole cycle is 90. And for some reason I was under the impression that it was like the whole like 90 and then it would come back and then like 90 again, not up, down, I don't know. But anyways, that- the, yeah, But the, it's just because you know, it doesn't, it, it wouldn't give the time to turn off yeah. And they come back. So they yeah. need to have that time to turn off, concentrate enough to be able to be expressed again and go back into uh, the migration state. Yeah. So that's one thing I really liked about this article, the figures, especially that when you just see the, the, like, the density of the fluorescent, I guess, cells, whatever, like the expression really helped me kind of visualize it and then understand it better. So um, that whole concept of like, I really like that about the article. So yeah, that was kind of my main thing. Oh, mm -hmm. one other thing that I, a term that kept coming back up was biological noise. And I couldn't find like a proper definition of what it was. Cause there was a couple different like definitions. So I wasn't sure if you were able to clarify. I, I, I answer to some extent. So what happens is when cells divide, the size of the cells are not necessarily the same which means that whatever they have in the cytoplasm, like a specific proteins, for instance, that are required for these transcription factors, right, uh, can be in, in different amounts. And that can create a little bit of a noise okay. in, in the translation of, the, of, of these uh, factors. So you have to, somebody, am I sending something <laughs> in there? So yeah, so the size of the cells are not necessarily equal whatever they contains in those cells also can have a different variation that can create a little bit of a noise in the way how they express. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. We should give the opportunity to other people that normally don't participate unless Anali you want to say it because you were also active. So there is just one thing I wanted to mention. It's, um, the fact that the, I think it was sig single cells uh -huh. um, that mutated in like a mother cell wouldn't affect the daughter cells. I found that interesting. So it wouldn't really affect the time of the segmentation. I found that very interesting in that article. Uh -huh. Yeah, as I say, Catherine, and all of you guys, is that it's, it's, um, it's a complicated process. It's, it's not that easy. And once again, we are so lucky <laughs> that we are where we are in the way we are, because every time we see some different aspect that we see something else that could have gone wrong. And it's, we see so many mutations that can occur, right? Okay, anybody else would like to uh, talk about it? Okay, so Jamie, your answer has been uh, answered by Emma and the paper, I guess. <clears throat> Nobody else has any other comment? Hi, yeah, I uh, had something I thought was interesting. It yes, was, Benjamin. Uh, so 
what re it's a very dense paper, like I think Annika was saying, there's a lot of content mixed together, but what sort of leapt out to me was near the ends, just the technique they use, the Firefly uh, Luciferase that I commented on. Yes, a nice comment. It's just such an interesting thing to me. I love stuff like that. And uh, Mar made a good point that uh, it's also being used now to track diseases and cancers, and it's awesome. And I think even just the study that I posted with it, this just uh -huh. the paragraph, they mentioned that one of the fun things about it was that the undergraduate students under the professors studying the compounds, they one of the parts of their jobs was to just go and collect fireflies. And I think that's just such a great thing to get paid for, you know? You want to you want to catch fireflies, Benjamin? Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> well, you see, it's it's, it's just uh, and I like your comment just for one uh, well, for various reasons. But one is just to see the extent of which how resourceful scientists are. That's exactly. one of the points, right? And, and second, that there is no such a thing as little job on a paper. Yeah. Right, even to go and catch their fireflies, you need to be very efficient, and then to do the extraction of the luciferase, also, you gotta be very efficient. So, every step, every step on that research project is important, right? And I'd like to comment just because of that reason well, many reasons, just because it's cool, it has a different perspective to the paper, but also just to illustrate that uh, everything is important in research, yeah. Okay. Anybody else would like to add? You are very quiet today. Last time, guys, you were way more active. Taylor, you also had a lot of comments. Do you want to say anything, Taylor? Or just type it if you prefer? I'm just trying to find people that haven't talked at all. Nope. This is when, like Sarah said, when we have the list, we say, uh, yep. I can maybe no. add another something. Sure, Annika, why not? Um, so I time? remember in the start of the paper, it mentions that like, I don't remember if it's rats or mice, but anyways, in rodents, it's about two hours for the like, Oscillation, oscillation cycle and then in human it's about four to six so I thought that oh, was gosh. interesting yeah I thought that was interesting because I like I wonder if it's because your individual is bigger so that way they have like longer to migrate or something like that I don't know well and not necessarily uh, but if you look at uh, the metabolic rate of in, in different individuals uh, rats have a high metabolic rate, right? Uh, yes, they are embryos, they, they, yeah, but if you look at the gestation period of a rat compared to a male, the number of cells that they need to create and so on is a smaller in a rat than it is in, in, in a man and a human, right? So all of these species specific aspects uh, relate that desomatogenesis in uh, mice or rats are two hours, right? And in chicks it's 90, because what we know about the 90 cycle is in chicks. So depending on the size of the species and the number of cells that each individual will have at birth, then that cycle can vary a little bit. In fish it's also something different. So it's very, very different. No more comments questions i normally try to go always on friday and go through the comments and then i come in i, I give votes to some people and things like that so i uploaded two more papers for next week one in the uh, paraxial mesoderm and the other one on the lateral plate mesoderm one is the uh, one is regarding the kidney cells and the multipotency of them. And the other one is in the lateral plate mesoderm as an overview of the different tissues that it helps uh, to create. Okay. Both of them are short, about 10, nine to 10 pages. So remember, you only need to read one of them 
hopefully there will be enough people reading either and not all one paper. Um, and that will be next week. After that is another paper and that will be getting to the end. So uh, remember that a good percentage of uh, your mark depends on this participation. Of course, those that participate in this discussion here gets good points and more than the ones that do only in the paper. But I have seen some students that have not participated even once in perusal. And that was my, my safest way for you guys to be able to participate and have an interaction with other students, okay? Okay, so let's get into the lab of today. Where is my PowerPoint? Okay, come on. I have too many windows open and then it's hard to get into the light. Okay, so lab number six, organogenesis. This is the first uh, lab of organogenesis. And of course, we're gonna be looking at uh, the ectoderm and its uh, derivatives. So we're here, two more labs and we're done. So, what is organogenesis? We have already defined that in lecture, so I'm expecting some of you will answer that. Shannon, what is organogenesis? Come on, somebody. I'll say the forbidden word. Uh, from my understanding, the organogenesis refers to the process of formation of organs in the developing fetus. Yes. Okay. So is the way how cells normally are going to interact and then be able to form some tissues and those tissues then will form some uh, organs. Okay, so the ectoderm I've seen in lecture is responsible for the formation of the central and peripheral nervous system, also the sensory organs, as well as the integument. Now, uh, once again, and uh, in the, as it was the case in the past labs, you must know the place of the cuts uh, so you can place yourself and make that mental uh, map of what you will be able to find and where. Okay, so here we have the nerula that was part of the um, last lab, and we're going to be looking then some serial and sagittal cuts, uh, whole mount, etc. So it's always important to determine which side is cranial and which side is caudal because the structures will differ depending on where. So if you don't know uh, the level of the cut, you cannot know what to expect, okay? So this is cranial, this is caudal, and this is somewhere over here, this cut. So because I see the soccer star here underneath, right? And then we have the neural tube and the eyes that would normally form around this region. So all the cuts are important to know. And, and, and then from one state to the next, uh, that will vary too. Now, 
because it's the central nervous system, we're going to be looking a little bit more into the different uh, brain ventricles and also the brain parts of it. Okay, so in here we're going to have uh, the model of the ventricles and you need to know the position of these wells. Okay. Oh, excuse the chico. Uh, so in here we have the lateral ventricles, so, so the one and two, here is the third ventricle and then the cerebral aqueduct, and then here is the fourth ventricle and the central canal. So you got to know the positioning of these ones in the brain too, because I, as you're going to see, we are asking you where is the talon soil, well is the rumbo soil, okay, so that's the cavity that is related to the rhombocephalon or the telencephalon or the myocephalon. Okay, so depending on the position of these soils, they're gonna take a specific names, okay? So the prosencephalon has the prosocephalon, the mesencephalon has the mesozoil, and the rhombocephalon has the rhombocephalon, okay? So here is the model that uh, you wanna be need to identify the different sections of different things, okay? So we say the lateral ventricle represents what? This is the lateral ventricle, right? So this represents it on the front part of the brain. What part is that part of the brain? What is the most anterior part of the brain? The hemispheres? No, well, this is the lateral hemispheres on each side, but this is the lateral ventricle. So, and this is the most anterior part, which corresponds to the telencephalon, right? Which means the telosoil, okay? The third ventricle, that is this one, corresponds to the level where the eyes are, more or less. So, that will be the diosoil, okay? The fourth ventricle is the rhombo cell, and the cerebral aqueduct is the mesozoil because of the mesencephal. Okay, so you gotta place yourself among these different parts of the brain. Okay, so <clears throat> in this part, we're gonna be using the cheek at different times. Okay. So we're gonna see that as neurolation and organogenesis progresses. Remember that the part in posterior part is still most of the time in gas relation while the anterior part is going on in a relation, okay? So we'll see a series of movements that are going to happen into the embryo. So from here to here, here to here, excuse me, is more or less a straight, but then 72 hours, we see a variation in the position, right? So they are getting some uh, movements that allow the formation of different sections of the embryo. Normally, we're gonna see two movements occurring in the chic embryo. One is called torsion, and the other one is called um, flexion, okay? So, uh, what is torsion? What do you think is torsion? How do you relate torsion? It would be like an inward, like, bend towards the inside or like a twist or something. Well, a twist is different than a torsion, right? So a torsion, but how is that twisting, okay? So a, a, a torsion is in, in a long axis. So you bend, it's like when you bow, right? That's you're flexing your spine, bowing down, okay? So it's always in one axis, and it's normally in the long axis. It starts at the head, as we see here, okay, and proceeds caudally. So it's like a bowing movement, okay? <coughs> and, and then, um, 
I, I ask for torsion or flexion? Which one I ask for? Torsion. Torsion. Okay. Yeah. So you bow a little bit and <clears throat> and 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 you twist to one side. It's like also when you're playing golf. Excuse me. Uh, I, I got confused myself. So torsion you go in the long axis, and it's when somebody has the the cup for playing golf, and then you twist and you swing, right? So it's a it's a it's a flexion. It's a twisting that is start in the long axis. And then flexion, excuse me again, that is the bowing, okay? So it's bending, flexion, it bends like this, and in torsion, you twist to one side. So in here, we would have our embryo, and then I say they're gonna make the cut at this level, and these are the structures that I will be finding, okay? So we have the myencephalon, then we have the metencephalon. This is the isthmus in this section. And then here, this is the head of mesenchyme and this is the mesencephalon. So once again, it's really important to see or to think about at what level that cut has been made in order to find the different elements. And again, we're gonna just be looking at the humor organogenesis embryo, just because we don't have uh, a real embryo, we just have the model. And in here, really important is just to see how the different structures from the 26 days to the 32 days are, okay? So we see here different structures, like here we have the limb fill or the arms and the legs are going to appear. We see here the eyes are forming a little better and then the heart has already twisted, the pharyngeal arches, the lip. So it's a lot of changes that have occurred into this embryo at this level. Come on. Now we're just gonna see uh, one little video to see a little bit of the early development up to here. I think I just need to share my sound also. Immediately after implantation, the inner cell mass of the blastocyst starts differentiating to form the primary germ layers. This process is called gastrulation. Cells of the inner cell mass migrate, divide and rearrange into an outer layer called the ectoderm and an inner layer called the endoderm. During gastrulation, some cells that are moving inward contribute to form the mesoderm the middle layer. The embryo is now called the gastrula. Gastrulation establishes the body pattern, that is, each tissue and organ of the adult originates in one of the three primary germ layers of the gastrula. The ectoderm gives rise to epidermal tissue, nervous tissue, retina, lens, cornea, etc. The endoderm forms the inner lining of the digestive tract, liver, pancreas, inner lining of the respiratory system, urinary bladder, urethra, vagina. The mesoderm gives rise to the dermis, all types of muscular tissue and various connective tissues. The development of the major organ systems is called organogenesis.
Some cells called stem cells are present in the inner cell mass. The stem cells are pluripotent, which means that they can give rise to any type of tissue except those of the placenta and the extra embryonic membranes. The developing embryo is protected by fetal membranes. These are the yolk sac, amnion, chorion and allantois. They are not a part of the embryo and are called extra embryonic membranes. The extra embryonic membranes protect the embryo, prevent it from drying out and help in obtaining food and oxygen and eliminating wastes. The closed sac between the embryo and the amnion, called the amniotic cavity, contains the amniotic fluid. The amniotic fluid acts as a cushion for the developing embryo and protects it from external blows. The amniotic fluid contains fetal cells. In a process called amniocentesis, the amniotic fluid is drawn out and examined to detect any abnormalities in the fetus. Embryonic development in humans is divided into three trimesters, spanning a period of about 280 days or 9 calendar months plus 10 days. This period is counted from the first day of the last menstrual cycle until parturition and is called the gestation period. In the human embryo, the heart is formed after one month of pregnancy. The limbs and digits are formed towards the end of the second month. Most of the organ systems develop towards the end of the first trimester, that is, in the third month. The limbs and external genitalia are well developed by this time. During the fifth month, the fetus shows signs of movement and the appearance of hair on the head. Towards the end of the second trimester, that is, in the sixth month, the fetal body is covered by fine hair, eyelids separate and eyelashes are formed. A fully developed fetus is ready for delivery by the end of nine months. Okay, so that gives us a little bit of an overview, especially at the end, showing that uh, for most of, just give me a second, I just want just to turn my camera on. Uh, okay. The organs start very early uh, to form, as we saw, the heart just within the first month they start forming and start pumping, and then the rest of the organs start appearing little by little, but by the end of the third trimester, uh, the, the, the third month, uh, almost all of the organs are have occurred. So uh, that's why it is so important to have uh, a good health, uh, eating healthy and all of that, because whatever happens, happens during those first uh, weeks of uh, pregnancy. The first six to eight weeks, that's the most important part of it. Okay. So uh, that's all for today, unless you have any uh, specific uh, questions. Uh, I think that uh, we can just resume for today. And as uh, as I say, try to read the um, uh, the papers, try to uh, comment on it, uh, and uh, use the chat. You know, that's the chat. You can send it privately to me or at least uh, comment to to everybody. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to create an environment where we all can participate. And that's what I thought with perusal that was easier. Um, and I want most of you guys to participate. I think that every time that I read the comments on perusal, I said, yeah, I, I'm enjoying that you are enjoying it because I see that 
you are reading together and helping to one another. So that's that's always very positive on my side to have an interaction with somebody else other than my husband and my kids, uh, for instance, or for you guys with maybe you and your pet animal that maybe you have, or if you're living with somebody else at home, well, then you have somebody else, but that is uh, also nice to have interaction with other people, right? Um, Please be careful if you are here in Sudbury or wherever you are, please don't be part of the statistics. Uh, we are trying all to, we are in all this together. So um, taking care of yourself is the first step of the process, okay? And I like the light at this time of the year, it's beautiful. So try to get a little bit out to, develop a little bit of that vitamin D that normally we lose so much during winter time. And even if it's half an hour, as I always say, self-care is important, okay? So hope to see you on Monday and have a good weekend. Thank you, Professor. Have a lovely weekend. You too.